Hi, welcome back to Mr. Graham's Maths. Um, I am going to have a look at the P1 paper that um, was just done yesterday in New Zealand. And this is for the P1 paper for the October-November um, 2019 session, which is um, 9709-13. Now, just one little disclaimer. And that is that I don't have a mark scheme to check these answers against. And if you find any mistakes, just pop them in the comments and I'll add some corrections in the description to this video. OK, so we'll go to question one. And we're being asked to do a binomial expansion here. Um, but the difference is instead of an X, we've got a Y. We don't do anything different with it. Uh, still use the binomial expansion uh, formula on your formula sheet. So we have one plus n times the x part or in this case it's a y and then n times n minus 1 over 2 factorial times y squared and then we're just going to simplify that down so we have a 15 here instead of 6 times 5 over 2 factorial then in the expansion of this here we want to find the coefficient of x squared being equal to 48 find the value of the positive constant p so We've got 1 plus something. That something is the y that was in um, the first question. So we can use that expansion we've already done. So we know that if we expand the first couple of terms, we'll have it in this form we just did in part 1. So y is equal to this bit here. 1 plus 6 times the y portion plus 15 times the y squared, just from part 1. Now to pull out x squared from that expansion, in uh, this first part here we could do 6 times minus 2x squared that would give it give us an x squared and in this one it would be the px when that got squared that would give us um, an x squared term and then it would get times by 15 so that gives us this portion here so then we have that we could have minus 12x squared from the first part uh, 15p squared x squared from the second part, and we know that that's equal to 48x squared, and then working through to solve that and get that p is equal to 2. 2 is about functions, so first we are asked to complete the square on um, g of x, and that's just taking you through those steps there. So, you, I mean, it's completing the square, you can go look that up if you're not following it. Um, all right, then find an expression for the inverse. Now just note here we've got that x is greater than 4 in the question, so we'll need to put that in um, later on. So first of all, put in y is equal to our function, and then rearrange to make x the subject. So we go through like this. Now at this point here, when we do a square root, we would normally think about plus or minus the square root. That's where we need to consider the domain of um our function up here g of x x is going to be bigger than four so when we do the square root we kind of think about it as taking like the positive side of things because we're looking at things that are bigger than something so we've got to take the positive of that square root that was done here now it's a little bit odd that it's a, a greater than four normally you're given the value that's like on the the edge of like the line of symmetry but not in this case okay so then we've got g to the inverse um, is going to be this 3 plus the square root of x plus 2 that we just worked out through here. Um, just putting that into its terms in its function form. We also are specifically told to make sure we state the domain of that function. Now the domain is what can go into the function. Now if it's the inverse, that is everything that can come out of the original function, so that's the range of g. Now the range of g we can tell from here if the smallest that four could, uh, x could be is 4. If we put 4 in here, 4 minus 3 is 1. 1 squared minus 2 is minus 1. That's the very smallest it can be. So g of x will always be bigger than minus 1. And that becomes the domain of our inverse function. On question 3, we have the equation of this curve. And it's a little bit of an unusual question, this one, um, in testing your knowledge of um, stationary points. It took me a, a minute to think about what exactly they were asking here. So the curve has no stationary points in the interval between a and b. Find the least possible value of a and the greatest possible value of b. So we're looking for stationary points, that means we need to differentiate just here, and then we will set that derivative equal to zero. 
factorize and we get these two values. Now try and picture what's happening and then you'll understand the question a bit more. So we've got this curve, it's a positive cubic, so it follows this kind of shape. And one of the stationary points happens at minus two and the other happens at uh, four over three. So that means if we're told there were no stationary points in this interval of a to b, where would that happen on your curve? So it'll have to be between the two stationary points. We have nothing in between those two values. Um, so the the smallest that we can go on the the left, if the, the the a side of things would be a minus two. We can't go any any further left than minus two, and we can't go any further right than four thirds because we would hit those two stationary curves, that stationary points on the curve. So that's how we get that um, a is minus two and b is four thirds. Now question four I thought was a fairly nice straightforward circle theory question. So we've got the diagram shows a semicircle here. Um, you can pause and read the question. All right, so express angle CAO in radians in terms of pi. So what I've done is um, pulled out this triangle here so I can just label it up a bit easier. We were looking for the angle CAO. So that's this angle here, the theta that I've marked. Um, now, this will be a right angle because it's the angle in a semicircle. So we have a right angle triangle and then we can use, just use. Um, so then we get the adjacent over the hypotenuse labeled as R and 2R. And that gives us a half. And if we do inverse cos, we get theta is pi by three. Now, finding the area of the shaded region, we need to find the area of the triangle and then subtract the area of this um, sector. So the area of, um, the, well, each of those, we need to find CB first. So to get, in fact, I'll just shrink this down so you can see all of it at once. So CB squared, CB. So working through that bit there, the area of the triangle is then half times R times root three R. So that's half the base times the height from um, this triangle that we've got up here. Then the area of the sector is half R squared theta put in the theta that we worked out in part one. And then the shaded area will be um, the area of the triangle minus the area of the sector to give us our final answer and simplify it down. Now, question five was conceptually difficult to think about. Um, I thought this is actually quite a hard question for uh, what it was actually asking you to do. So we want to link S and V in this particular format. So I first of all just started off by writing out what V and S would be from the, the diagram that was given to us. So that's what we've got there in terms of um, X's. So V is 8X cubed and S is 28X squared. So then we have, um, we've got the problem where we need to link S and V together and it's not quite so, not obvious straight away what to do. But if we can rearrange X so that we, like this this first bit here, if you rearrange this so that x is the subject, then we can put that x into the formula for the surface area, and you will come out with what we were asked for um, in the question, 7v to the power of 2 thirds. I'll just shrink this so you can see it on one screen, and then we'll move on to the next part. So the second part is about rates of change. So I always start rates of change questions by um, writing down the information we know. So we're told V is 1000, DS by DT is two. We want to work out DV by DT, which is the rate of increase of the volume over time. And then we also know uh, a formula that links S and V from part one. So I always know that we need to differentiate the formula that we've got to start with. So that's what I've done first. So DS by DV, is going to be equal to this. And then to work out dv by dt, we use the chain rule. Now we've got um, ds by dv, but we need dv, dv by ds. So we just flip what we've got for ds by dv and then multiply it by ds by dt. So we can work that through. And then we're told that it's happening when v is a thousand. So pop that in and continue your working through to there. Now, usually units aren't required for the marks here, but um, I like to put them in for completeness. So question six is 
fairly straightforward but it's got a lot of places that you can make mistakes in it so you just need to be quite careful we've got a line and a curve and we want to know um, what values of k will work so that we get two distinct distinct points of intersection so this means we set the two lines equal to each other we're looking to find points of intersection uh, move everything over to one side so we have an equation equal to zero and then we have to set the discriminant greater than zero to get two distinct points make sure it's greater than not greater than or equal to because equal to would make a tangent we want two distinct points not um, just that they intersect so pop in the values of b squared minus 4ac into our equation we get this we get a quadratic in k um, now always go to the point where you can factorize this or do quadratic formula or whatever to work out the critical values so we know that the critical values of this will be um, at a half and minus one but then draw yourself a little diagram to know which way you need to go from that so we needed those uh, the product of these to be greater than zero so we need to know when our quadratic um, goes above the x-axis and so that happens over this side and over this side when we go above the x-axis so we need to go to the right of a half and to the left of minus one so we can write that k fit satisfies these inequalities here then we move on with that for the next part and we've got for two particular values of k the line is a tangent now tangents happen when the discriminant is, is is exactly equal to zero now we just worked out those values will happen at minus one and half when k is exactly equal to them rather than the greater than or less than we needed in the previous part so if we um are looking for a tangent to the curve we've got two possible k's which means there are two possible tangents and we want to know where those two tangents cross and hopefully it'll be at the x-axis so that we can answer the question so set those two um, values of k to get our two tangent lines we want to know where they cross so these will meet when those two y's are equal to each other which means it's when x is two-thirds now when x is two-thirds we can put that back into one of the equations doesn't matter which and show that y equals zero if y is zero that means it's on the x-axis as was required seven part one is a really straightforward one in fact just pause the video and read it it's just using some very basic um, substitution and trig stuff part two is to use that expression that we just worked out was equivalent in part one and solve that so if we have that um, equation from part one set it equal to zero and then x would be a third and x would be one through factorizing now if x is equal to the cos squared theta that we had in part one that sets it equal to a third and one solve those remember when we're square rooting we need to do the plus or, or minus of those um, square roots so cos theta could be these four different things which means we get four different solutions in our range we're only going from naught to 180 you can draw yourself a diagram to make sure you've covered everything so this was my little picture down at the bottom here to check that I hadn't missed um, any possible solutions.